into Second Peter, having dealt with one Peter, finishing there uh, last session, uh, finishing chapter five. So we come to Second Peter now, into the uh, three chapters that uh, Peter gives us here uh, also. Reading from verse one, chapter one, if you would uh, wish to follow uh, me in the reading of God's Word. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. And if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even if I, as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me, moreover I will endeavour that ye, be, ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Thus far we read in God's holy and infallible word. Verses 1 and 2 are our text for today. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith, with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The knowledge, the knowledge of God is our uh, title, title of our message today in these two verses, verses 1 and 2. A true knowledge, that is, a true knowledge of God, is what Peter is speaking about, conforming to reality. The true knowledge of God, which is required as necessary for us to 
enter into the everlasting kingdom, verse 11, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if that is you have this true knowledge of God. He speaks, of course, of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ and the ensuing judgment. His letter is brief, but packed full of spiritual riches, gems. Uh, an epistle, I might say, that has been long neglected, not preached on even till this time. Peter, he's an apostle, chapter 1 and verse 1. He's the author of this epistle. He uh, confirms that in verses 13 and 15. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, body that is, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. How always in remembrance? because Peter's writing it down so that it will be carried on through the generations even until this time. So he is clearly the author and so therefore it is he being an apostle, he being the author, humanly speaking, it is therefore canonical, it belongs to the canon of scripture contrary to what many others would say, have said and continue to do say. Uh, if you want the uh, technical details on the argument for this, then the commentary by Simon Kistemaker is the one you need. He has about 20 pages on this very subject, confirming, showing, demonstrating that Peter is the author and it is therefore canonical. He speaks that soon uh, his demise will be soon, verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, because Peter's still in that dungeon in Rome that we saw in his first letter, soon to be martyred. Uh, he was martyred, according to the uh, Eusebius, the historian, uh, he was martyred somewhere between 64 and 68 AD. Peter, he tells us that he's aware of Paul's letters, his earlier letters, the verses 15 and 16, and the count that the long suffering of our Lord Jesus is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you as also in all his epistles, and so on. So um, this comes later, and it's uh, estimated, we think, somewhere around AD 68 was when Peter wrote this epistle. He exhorts us not only to have a true knowledge of God, but to grow in that true knowledge of God. Having received promises, uh, verse 4, where are, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that ye may be partakers of the divine nature, and um, he tells us that um, we're, we're to add to those, we're to cash in those checks, promises that God has given to us, add to them spiritual virtues. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and temperance patience, and patience godliness, and godliness brotherly kindness, and so on. So we're not to stand still, but we're to add to what we have received. Adding spiritual values, that is. He warns us of false teachers who will bring in damnable heresies. But of course, it's only if you have a true knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, only then will you be able to recognize those false teachers and recognize and avoid those damnable heresies of which there are many, even in this day, and will continue to the end. He deals with the end time, of course, and our pertinent behaviour, as a consequence of it being uh, the end of all things being near, as he told us in his first epistle, um, 
uh, then um, as a result of these things, he says, uh, what manner of uh, people, lifestyles ought you to have. So if you do not um, uh, to have a true knowledge of God, it is essential that you have a knowledge of Christ. If you do not know Christ, then you do not have a true knowledge of God. One uh, follows the other, you might say. So that puts a lie to those who say, you know, perhaps there are some people in the world, you know, in far-flung places, they've never heard of Jesus, they haven't got Bibles, but maybe God has brought them to know himself to a true knowledge of himself. No, no, no. Without Jesus Christ, a true knowledge of God is not obtainable. Peter is blunt according to his character. There is no political correctness with us. He tell, uh, with him, he tells it to us just like it is. We like him, a man after my own heart. So there are three things here in these two verses, the cherished faith, the consequent righteousness, and the complete knowledge. The cherished, the like precious faith. Simon Peter, he says, in the Greek original, it's Simeon. That's, his, that's the Jewish version of Simon. So he's Simeon, and he's Peter, Simon Peter, he's Peter the Rock Petros. Matthew 16, verse 18, when the Lord Jesus Christ gave him that name, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The uh, rock upon which Christ will build his church is not Peter himself as a rock, but the confession that Peter Petros makes. And what is his confession? His confession is, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. On that confession, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, says the Lord Jesus Christ. Not... Um, the papal system of Rome who claim that Peter is the rock and Peter is the rock upon which Christ will build his church. No, upon his confession of Jesus as being Messiah. And um, Peter of course is now aged and Peter now knows himself like he never did before. He's Simeon and he's Petros. Simeon is the old dispensation Peter in the flesh who was warned time and again by his Saviour but took no heed and catastrophically fell denying his Saviour and the Lord Jesus Christ but consequently restored uh, to uh, his discipleship. So he's Simeon there's still the old Simeon there, still the old nature there, just like with the rest of us. But he's also Peter, he's also Petros, his Christian name. He's a new creature in Christ. He understands that now as he never understood it before. He's a slave, servant, reads in the original Greek, slave. He's a slave. Um, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's a slave, not a servant, because a servant, you see, is dismissible. Uh, if I get a servant uh, to come and, and to, to dig my garden, say, you know, but I don't like the way he's doing it. I don't think he's being efficient. He's not doing it the way I wanted him to do it. So I, I just dismiss him because he's a servant. I get rid of him. I fire him, you know. We had an agreement, a contract, he would dig my garden and I would give him whatever for it, but I've dismissed him from my service, okay? That's not Peter. Peter is under ownership. He's a slave. Now, if I, have, if I own a slave and I call my slave to dig my garden, tell him how he, I want him to do it, he best do it because he is a slave. He's not dismissible. I don't fire him. I own him. 
Peter is a slave of Jesus Christ. He's under the ownership of Jesus Christ. Christ owns him. By his death he purchased Simon Peter by his atoning death. And both he and Peter's readers, ours to this day, are lovingly, willingly belonging as slaves belonging to Jesus Christ. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ and so therefore he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So therefore what he writes to us carries divine authority. It is God breathed, divinely inspired. It is the Word of God written by the pen of Peter if you like but um, breathed out, every word of it breathed out and inspired by God and so therefore carries divine weight and divine authority. Faith, this like precious faith, this cherished faith, um, uh, faith is, um, faith is, is, is content, uh, the content of what we believe, the doctrines, if, um, the content of a Christian's faith is the doctrines of the Bible, um, what we believe. But then faith is also subjective, it's the act of believing, the act of trusting and relying upon what we know to be true. It's two sides of the same coin, if you like. They're not separate, they're together, one on either side, but they are distinguished. Content and the act of believing. Here Peter is speaking about the latter. He's speaking about the subjective. He's talking about the act of trusting, relying upon. Um, a like precious valued, cherished faith. Because it's this faith, you see, that unites Peter and unites all his readers, all those of like precious faith. It unites us together. We are one. We are the body of Christ. We are united together. We share this like precious faith. This personal trust this reliance upon God through Jesus Christ that engrafts us into Christ, puts us into Christ. And we obtain, uh, we obtain that have obtained like precious faith. We have obtained this faith. There was a time when we did not have this faith. We obtained it. At some point in our history, we obtained this like precious faith. It was given to us. In the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 20, 72 rather, what is justifying faith? Justifying faith is a saving grace wrought in the heart of a sinner by the Spirit and Word of God, whereby he being convinced of his sin and misery and of the disability in himself and all other creatures to recover him out of his lost condition, not only assent us to the truth of the promise of the gospel, but receiveth and rest upon Christ and his righteousness therein is held forth for pardon of sin and for the accepting and accounting of his person righteous in the sight of God for salvation. Obtained. A principle of faith infused into us by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. The Holy Spirit working in conjunction with the Word of God with His outbreathed Word. That's the instrument the Holy Spirit uses in salvation and He uses no other, the Word of God, the inscripturated, God-breathed Word, Holy Scripture. A principle infused in us by the Spirit and Word of God bringing us into a living contact, into a union, and grafting us into and uniting us with Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5 verse 30, For we are members of his body, 
of his flesh and of his bones. It's the gift of God. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That's how we obtain that God gave us the gift of faith. A twig. A branch cannot engraft itself into a tree. And neither can you or I or anybody else engraft themselves into Jesus Christ. God has to do that. Faith, of course, as Peter tells us, and as he focuses upon in this um, epistle, speaking of true knowledge, in faith includes knowledge. It includes content. Um, John 17, verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know, know, have a knowledge, a true knowledge of thee, um, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Faith requires knowledge. Saving faith, I mean, requires knowledge. Persuasion. It's a persuasion. We are persuaded to believe as a result of what? Knowledge. 2 Timothy 1 verse 12 for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. He knows, he has knowledge of whom he believes, and he is persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Knowledge. Faith. Sub the subjective trusting reliance upon what he knows whom he knows, and knows has the ability to save his soul. You can, have a, you can have knowledge, but without trust, without faith. Without faith in that knowledge, it's profitless. And if you have no faith, then, well, there is no knowing. But the two join together, you see, joined to knowledge, joined to faith, well, amounts to this, this, this treasure, this, this like precious faith, this, this, this treasure, the knowledge of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. It's a treasure. It's precious. Without confidence, there is no knowing. There is no true knowledge of God. Confidence. Con fide. Con with fide. Faith with faith, with confidence, in the content, in the knowledge revealed to us, the true knowledge of God in Jesus Christ, that God has commanded, says the Apostle, has commanded to shine into our hearts, giving us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And both are to grow together again, verse 5. Giving all diligence add to your faith, virtue unto virtue, knowledge. Both are to grow together. It's better to know that not the person, um, well, the, the, the better you know a person, the better you can trust them. I mean, if somebody, uh, if I were to, Say, for instance, you didn't know me from Adam, and I come to your door, and I say to you, I want you to trust me with your, let's say, your finances or your jewelry. And you say to me, get out of here. I don't even know you. Trust you with my finances? I wouldn't even trust you with my dog. You don't trust, you don't trust people you don't know. And you certainly don't trust them with valuable things, people you don't know. Well, how much less are you going to trust somebody with your precious soul, your eternal destiny, that you don't even know? 
It's not knowing the true knowledge of which Peter speaks is not it's not knowing about God, not knowing about Jesus Christ. You might say to me, oh, I know Prime Minister Johnson. I know President Trump. Well, what you actually mean is you know about them because you've seen them on the media and on the internet. But you don't really know them. You know about them. You've never even met them. You don't know them. So it's not knowing about, but it's knowing Him, it's knowing God, a true knowledge of God revealed to us through Jesus Christ. And as a result of that knowledge given to us, revealed to us, and the precious, cherished gift of faith given to us that we have obtained, we yield to and we rest in Him, Jesus Christ. Matthew 11, verse 28, as he bids us to come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The cherished faith. The consequent righteousness. Like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Through, in, the righteousness of God. Faith is connected to righteousness. Only in righteousness is faith, only that is in the righteousness of God, through the righteousness of God, is faith possible, is faith possessed. Righteousness is a divine attribute. Um, Psalm 145 verse 17 the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Romans 3.26 to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be the just and justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. All that God wills, all that God desires, all that God does is perfectly holy, perfectly, is righteous to the uttermost. He shines, he bristles with righteousness. His every attribute is crowned with holiness. And he judges. Those with like precious faith, he judges. He judges all his elect to be in perfect harmony with his perfect holiness, staggering, but, the, but he judges those of like precious faith. He judges them. In his righteousness, he judges them to be in perfect harmony with his perfect holiness. By an imputed righteousness, that is, of course, through the atoning death, through the propitiatory sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord justifying us Romans 2 and verse 22 and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness now it was not written for his sake alone that was imputed to him but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification Righteousness is an attribute of God. It is our justification, it is sanctification, our deliverance from the rule of sin. Romans 6 verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. But here, here in speaking of in or through the righteousness of God, in the righteousness of God I think is better, he refers to this attribute of God, the righteousness of God. God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God in Trinity. Revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Faith, the light precious faith, connects us to the righteousness of God. And God imparts, God imputes to those 
to those given to Christ before the foundation of the world and to those given like precious faith, the elect of God, all the elect of God that is, he imparts, he imputes to them this righteousness. He makes them right, in other words, because there was a time when they were wrong. There's a time when they were uh, contrary to God in their nature and in their practice. He makes them right. It's a sentence passed by the judge. The judge dons the cap, the judge's cap, down comes the gavel and he makes the declaration. The judge says, right, not just not guilty, righteous, perfectly righteous, as I am righteous. So the sinner is found not just not guilty, but altogether righteous. Or oh, they are sinners, or oh, they have sinned, and they have sinned against the judge, says King David. Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive thee, and goes on to say that against thee, thee only have I sinned. We have sinned against the judge himself. So the cause of our justification, the cause of our righteousness, is our Savior. Through the righteousness of God, verse 1b, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the cause of our justification. He's the cause of our righteousness. Because He stands as our substitute for all who have been given to Him. He suffers their death. He suffers their penalty. He suffers their sins in his own body on the tree. Isaiah 53 and verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. It's an unchangeable, unalterable declaration because God himself is unchangeable. And does not change his mind. So when he declares the sinner righteous, that is an everlasting righteousness. And there is, as the apostle says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, delightfully, wonderfully, there is therefore now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus, engrafted into Christ Jesus, in union with Christ Jesus, by a like precious faith. The Apostle Paul, Philippians 3 and verse 8, Yea, doubtless, he says, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge, knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God, which is the righteousness which is of God by faith. Oh, he suffered the loss of all things. Paul was a high flyer. He was going places in Judaism. He was a rising star. He sat at the feet of Professor Gamaliel, well educated, good mind. He was going places until God revealed himself in Jesus Christ to him on that Damascus road and he saw for the first time in his life that all his work, all his law work, it was all filthy, his own right, it was all his own doing, all his religiosity. And he gave it all up. He threw it all away. It's all, it's all done, he says. Give it all up in order that he might win Christ, in order that he might be found in him by faith, in order that he might have a righteousness, not of him, not his own filthy rags, but the righteousness, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. He was just a religious man, just like the Islamist, 
just like the Roman Catholic, just like the Watchtower Society. It's all dharma. It's all self-righteousness. It's all works. It's not the righteousness of God and it does not lead to a true knowledge of God. Applied, and it's applied by faith, counted and imputed for righteousness. Genesis 15, Abraham and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Romans 4 verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. The judge accepts. The judge on the throne, he accepts our, he accepts our faith for righteousness. Not because of any worth in faith itself, any value in faith in and of itself, but because of what faith is. It's that bond, it's that union, union with Christ. It connects us with Christ. It, it enables us to lay hold upon Christ and his righteousness, which is the righteousness of God. And thus we are accepted. By God. Faith, the light precious faith is the hand that reaches out and receives, receives the righteousness of God in Christ and gives us acceptance with God. The completed knowledge, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This is a usual, usual salutation. Most of the apostolic epistles begin in like manner, so not unusual. Grace, that's God's unmerited favor. You don't work for it. You don't be religious for it. You don't pay for it. You don't do nothing for it. It is totally and completely unmerited, unearned. It's the undeserved favor of God. You don't deserve it. What you deserve is wrath and hell, eternal damnation. That's what we deserve. But grace through faith in Christ, we have the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. And he looks upon us, therefore, from that point, he looks upon us with pleasure and delight. Opposed, that is, to formerly looking upon us with displeasure and wrath. That's all gone. Peace is the absence of conflict. It's the absence of the end of war. Of enmity, if you like, Romans 8 verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against that war with God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be? That's our natural state and condition. Conceived in sin, born in sin, live in sin, in enmity against God, contrary to God in our natures, and contrary to God in our practice too. Grace and peace be multiplied. This is an apostolic wish. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, and so therefore it is authoritative. It comes with authority, it comes with power. Because Peter, you see, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, is a true representative of God. And so, uh, grace and peace are actually conveyed, the same is conveyed to the church. Then, as Peter is writing, the readers then, and to us now and to the end of the age, Grace and peace are actually conveyed to the church. And it's God, of course, he's the one who multiplies that grace to his people, to his elect children. And he increases it. This is not, of course, um, uh, this is not the, uh, unto you through the knowledge of God. 
when he speaks of the knowledge of God here, he's not talking about a general, he's not talking about an intellectual knowledge. He's talking about um, an ethical, he's talking about a divine, he's talking about a precise, he's talking about a correct, he's talking about a true knowledge of God. This is the theme of Peter's epistle, a true knowledge of God that originates in God it's God communicating the knowledge of himself to us, to his people. Is it Job who asks the question, he says, can, can, you by, can you by searching find out God? And of course the answer to that question is no. You can search hither and thither up one side and down the other, but unless God reveals the knowledge of himself to you, you're faced with a blank wall, an empty basket. You have nothing. This knowledge, this true knowledge of God originates in God. God communicates the knowledge of himself to his elect. And grace and peace are conditioned by this. See, you can know the Son, you can know about Jesus Christ, you can know about the Incarnation. You can be a veritable theologian. You can be a real smart aleck. And you can know, you can know theology upside one side and down the other. You might be the best theologian that ever walked the face of this earth. Maybe you've written, written books on the subject. You know, you know Jesus, you know about Jesus, you know the Incarnation, you know about his life and ministry, his death, resurrection, his return and the judgment to come. You can know it all. But it's not enough to just simply and only know just cold, intellectual, hard facts. It's of no profit. This true knowledge of God is a spiritual knowledge of God. It's an experiential knowledge of God, which God himself divinely applies to the elect. The one thing that you can say about all the elect of God is that they have a true knowledge of God that he communicates to his children, to his people, those of like precious faith. by the righteousness of God, through the righteousness of God, says Peter. Righteousness, the righteousness of God through faith. And so we become the recipients, the beneficiaries, that is, of the life, the risen life, and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have we have the seed of the risen, risen Christ in us. We have all the benefits of his atoning death, propitiation, the wrath of God removed from us, forgiveness, cleansing, washing, and the blood of God's Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us and goes on and on and on cleansing us from all sin until we be saved to sin no more. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. And this true knowledge of God, this true knowledge is um, sovereignly given of God through Jesus Christ his Son. God is the author of it. He's the revealer of himself. And he reveals himself to whomsoever he chooses to reveal himself. And Peter's writing this brief second epistle writes to us to instruct us that we might grow in this true spiritual experiential knowledge of God. Chapter 3 verse 18. That's how he finishes, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. The spiritual, experiential knowledge of God. In order that, as he said in his first epistle in chapter 5 and verse 10, that he might uh, perfect 
and that he might establish, strengthen, and settle you. Spiritual, experimental knowledge of God is true knowledge. It's true knowledge. And that true knowledge of God is a sure foundation for life and for godliness and for eternal, eternal glory. It's growing in intimacy with our Savior God until we see him face to face until we know him and are like him, until we receive the end of our faith. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. That's Peter's purpose in writing this epistle, that we, that we might grow in this, true knowledge of God that he himself has communicated to us his people that we might grow in it to maturity to perfection may God may God in his grace multiply grace towards us may he grant it